My name is James McCowan. I'm the Clinical Director of the Addiction Recovery Management Service and I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I run a clinic that works with teens and young adults with substance use disorders, including marijuana, alcohol, and opiate use disorders. I came into this field through my interest in child psychopathology generally, the importance of working with children and teenagers as a way to help them figure this out earlier on, them struggling with this for a long time. So it was this idea that if we can intervene sooner and earlier, hopefully we can have them have a better outcome in their life generally. Marijuana is the most commonly used substance currently in teenagers and young adults. It outpaces alcohol use, nicotine, as well as opiates. Marijuana has changed quite dramatically over the past several years and decades. In the 80s and 90s, marijuana was much less potent, 3%, 5% THC. Now we're looking at anything from 18% all the way up to 90% THC. The brain responds to THC in different ways, and so over time your brain gets more efficient at thinking and processing information. And THC binds to certain receptors that are involved in neurodevelopment. And so that is likely having some impacts on normal brain development, which are concerning to us. So things like affecting cognition, memory, processing speed. It may affect this process called pruning, which is how your brain gets more efficient. It may affect what's called myelination, which is a fatty tissue substance that wraps around a neuron that makes it communicate quickly. So how much is too much marijuana is a very good question. Teenagers ask us a lot about that. Generally for the teenager, it's no marijuana is really okay for their brain development. However, many teenagers do smoke marijuana or use marijuana. We don't have good equivalents in science right now to tell us about dosing of marijuana. Studies have looked at changes in brain development in youth and have found even as infrequently as once a week can impact brain development risk. Generally, if a teenager is infrequently using once or twice a month, that's probably not going to result in long-term damages. It depends, however, if they have a genetic vulnerability to addiction or they have a co-occurring psychiatric illness like depression, ADHD, or they've had psychosis stemming from marijuana use we generally recommend no use in that context. Like many people think marijuana is not addictive. For most people, it is not. About one in nine people develop a dependency on marijuana, and so the majority of people use it in a recreational way that may be not harmful. Folks that use marijuana vary in the type of presentation. Obviously, some people use it who do not have co-occurring mental health issues or physical issues, but those that we understand to develop a dependency on marijuana tend to have higher rates of psychiatric illness, like depression, anxiety, psychosis is a big risk factor, and some of that predates the onset of their marijuana problems, and some of it is a consequence of their marijuana problems. So an example of someone who might have depression as a young teenager through a life event may struggle to get adequate treatment for that and then normally would encounter marijuana in school through a teen or a friend or an older sibling. And then it really works for their mental health issue. They find that it helps them feel less anxious or maybe solves their depression. And then they get in that habitual use pattern and then the marijuana takes on its own, changing in the brain and results in them developing a dependency. Having a cannabis use disorder means that you've met certain criteria of having more significant use issues, difficulty controlling, maybe tolerance, withdrawal. There are 11 symptoms that are used to diagnose a cannabis use disorder. And someone needs to say yes to at least two of those to have a substance use disorder whether it be alcohol, opiates, or marijuana, all the way up to they could endorse yes to all 11 and have a much more severe cannabis use disorder. 
Working with teens with marijuana use is very complicated. They are at different places with their awareness of the problem, their interest in addressing the issue, their sense of whether marijuana is harmful or not. That's why I find that work so interesting because they're always very opinionated about their use. Generally, we try and hear their perspective, try and understand what role it plays for them, good and bad. We also want to provide them with accurate information about marijuana. We try and provide education to them about the consequences. We also want to help teens address cravings they have, situations in which they may be triggered to use, the role of their co-occurring mental health issues. We want to try and address that as well to help them try and reduce their use. If we can get them to abstain, that's our goal. But for a teenager, if we can get them using more safely in a harm reduction context, smoking a lot less, increasing their functioning, going to school, working, with some ongoing use, we may be okay for that particular patient. Recently I have a young person who's 20 at a local university who was smoking multiple times a day, high potency marijuana, even obtained a medical marijuana card, wasn't going to class, not doing great academically, was getting some paranoia from heavy smoking, some anxiety, and so in an assessment we determined that he had a cannabis use disorder as well as social anxiety disorder and depression. And so we really tr were working on treating all three of those in conjunction with one another because they're all related. So his social anxiety would drive smoking because he'd be anxious to leave and go to a party so he'd get high first and then he'd feel bad about it after and that could impact the depression which would then fuel more smoking to deal with those feelings. And so gradually we worked on, on cognitive behavioral therapy strategies to address the marijuana use, helping him set reasonable, realistic goals, providing education about risks. He was very anxious about his health. So we talked about brain impacts and lung impacts. We set goals around cutting down. I had him meet with a psychiatrist to think about medication that might help with the depression which was moderate to severe, so it was impacting him going to class. And over a six month period, it takes a long time, he really cut down, was able to obtain a long period of abstinence, saw some improvements in his anxiety and depression, had a relapse, which is also normal and part of this recovery process. We keep working with him, we don't kick him out of treatment, we maintain our therapy appointments and we understand what was the context of the relapse, to understand the triggers and what role anxiety played in that and he's back to a period of abstinence and I just saw him last week and he's feeling really good about not smoking, he feels better, he's not out the woods but really, really improved. We see the role of parents as instrumental in the work we do with teenagers and young adults. Many parents feel helpless, lost, confused, angry, all sorts of emotions. So we provide parental support and guidance through really directive skills training for parents around strategies like communication or how to respond if they come home high or throw a glass at the wall, all these different issues that come with young people that have a substance use disorder and a potential mental health issue. We found that involving parents results in better outcomes for youth, both in terms of the youth staying in treatment longer, but also lower rates of use because parents are involved and maybe improving the family climate. They may be setting appropriate boundaries and limits around behavior, which helps. And then a third impact we see is that it really helps the parents' own mental health. So parents report improvements in their stress management. They have a plan. They feel less alone because we also have them join parent group with other parents so they can share just the challenges of being a parent of a young person with a substance use disorder. We're quite behind the ball when it comes to educating teenagers and young adults or the public generally about the impacts of marijuana. The Department of Health have done a really fantastic job in the government generally around tobacco harms. We're seeing that problem now with the lack of public health messaging around the risks of marijuana. I think there's a lot of catch up that needs to happen to educate parents, 
teenagers around the facts of marijuana. There's a lot of influence through commercialization of marijuana that I think can dilute messages or even send confusing messages to teenagers. And so there's a lot to do to catch up, but they are working on that and, and really trying to target middle schoolers with education around marijuana, teenagers, as well as parents. In the future, I'd like to see a couple of different things shift when it comes to marijuana. I would like to see an increase in education about what we know science-wise in terms of the impact on youth and young adults in particular. I'd like to see really an increase in the provision of treatment for teenagers and young adults in generally. There are few providers that have training in treating young people with substance use disorders, so we have to increase training of doctors and psychologists and nurses and social workers in youth addiction, and particularly with marijuana, because it's becoming the real main issue at this point. And then I'd like to see a real shift in supporting research. We struggle to get funding, there's little funding out there, so I'd like to see a lot of improvements in our ability to research the impacts long term, what treatments are effective for young people, what medications may be useful, as well as looking at the impacts of the pharmacology of marijuana on people. To take this course and learn about others, click on the link in the description and subscribe to this channel.